So in this lecture segment, we'll look at various deeper issues related to fork and to multiprocessing. The biggest lesson to take away from this segment is that you need to be really careful with fork. It's the most dangerous system call in the Unix API. Improper use of it can cause an explosion of processes, potentially bringing down the operating system itself. There are some safeguards against this. Users often have a process limit that stops them from creating too many running processes. But these are not always turned on, and they're not foolproof, as we'll see. To illustrate how easy it is to do destructive things with Fork, we're going to consider a few questions here. And very importantly, do not execute the code in these questions, even as an experiment. So uh, we'll draw the code up here to look at for discussion with uh, an appropriate label of warning on the top of it. And this brings us to question one. What does the code I just wrote up here do? How many processes get created by it? And how long do they run? And what's their relationship to each other? Who's the parent? Who's the child? And uh, coming back from a, uh, a pause there. The answer is that the parent process will endlessly spawn child processes. All of them will be siblings of one another. Fortunately, each child process will exit the loop immediately since its fork call returns zero and will end. And hopefully the endless loop silence that you'll get by running the rogue parent will prompt you to control C it quickly. Question two. Since the children exit so quickly in that code, at least the process table won't get all choked up with processes by this rogue, right? All right? Again, stop and think about that. Wrong, actually. No one has waited for the children. The parent did not do any waits. So this is a fast way to jam the process table with zombies. Killing the parent will finally cause a nit to adopt the zombies and wait for them, but that process table is going to fill awful fast in the time it takes you to do that control C. Okay, so one bad code deserves another here. What about this one? Let's uh, kind of uh, invert the call and go for a while. Not fork. Ben, think a little about that. And what does that one do? Well, in this case, the parent will spawn a child and then exit immediately. The child will do the same, and so on. Each parent gets a non-zero value from fork, thus dies as soon as it has created one child. The result is an endless sequence of single parents, each dying immediately after giving birth. There is always just one process doing yet another fork call, with all its parents having died. And then question four. So what does that do to the process table? Is it any better than what we did in question one? Again, pause and think about that. And the answer is, as far as jamming the table up, yeah, it's better because each dying process immediately gets inherited by init because its parent has already died. The result is init busily waiting for all the dead parents, while the sole and constantly changing living child cranks out new generations. Question number five, then. So we'll just kill that one one array process, and we're good, right? Right? Coming back from a pause there. Nope. Wrong. The problem with this scenario is that the process that needs killing changes hundreds of times a second as each new generation is forked and the old one dies like some fast mutating virus. And depending on the particulars, stopping this runaway can require rebooting the entire OS. It can't be done in any other way. Now even writing this stuff in a text document is like publishing the DNA sequence for smallpox, so be really careful with process creation. And just to drive that point home, let's put a couple of Reminder comments on uh, the code we have here. The first one, in effect, is the Night of the Living Dead. 
creating infinite zombies, and the second one, the fast mutating virus. Now, the line 27 sleep call here in our example code from before opens up uh, some other interesting discussion. Does the sleep code have some kind of loop where the operating system checks the current time over and over until one second has elapsed? Is it like a do check the current time while not waited one second yet? No. One second's a long time in CPU land, enough for a billion machine language instructions. Any such loop would consume a lot of CPU time, checking millions of times. Waiting for some event by repeated loop check is called spin waiting, and it's a bad thing. The operating system performs that sleep call by marking in the aforementioned process table a flag that says don't even run this sleeping process until a full second has elapsed, which will be at such and such a time. Now, if the operating system doesn't spin wait, then how does it know when a second has passed? How does the current time get tracked? The operating system sets up a regular hardware-generated timer interrupt, coming typically once every hundredth of a second. When handling this interrupt, the operating system does housekeeping for all processes, including checking whether a sleep time is completed and the process may be run again, and also switching the CPU between different runnable processes so they all get a fair share and appear to be running in parallel. As you probably know, at least in a one CPU machine, only one process is being run at any time. But if the running process changes as frequently as once every hundredth of a second, then they all appear to be running at the same time. You'll learn a lot more about this in an operating system class, but for now it's worth a couple of quick in-lecture questions. So question six. I just said that spin weights were a bad thing, in capitals, no less. But uh, now I tell you the OS gets interrupted all the time by this timer interrupt. Isn't that just as bad as a spin weight loop? I'm back from a pause. It's very important to get perspective on relative times in the operating system world. To us, any blindingly fast time from a hundredth of a second to one nanosecond all fall into the category of too fast to see. But they're very different in practice. If a CPU can run a billion instructions per second, that's one per nanosecond, then it can run 10 million instructions between time interrupts. That's uh, a lot of instructions. Timer interrupts at one one hundredth of a second intervals are about as bothersome to the CPU as a weekly check of a task list would be to you or me. By contrast, a spin weight would completely occupy the CPU, like having to constantly watch a boiling pot, and it wouldn't be able to do anything else. Even if the CPU is running some user code, the timer interrupt makes it jump to the operating system code for timer interrupt handling. This way, no user process can monopolize the CPU, say in some long computing loop with no chance to run OS code that might switch the CPU to some other process. Your program may decide to compute the value of pi to infinite precision, but within a hundredth of a second it's going to be interrupted. The CPU will forcibly jump to OS code, which code may decide it's time for you to take a break and for the CPU to move on to some other process for a while. This is called preemptive scheduling. And operating systems that do it, which is to say all serious general purpose operating systems, are called preemptive operating systems. The alternative is a non-preemptive operating system. Old versions of Windows and Mac operating systems, really old, like uh, Windows 3.1 or pre-OS uh, 10 Mac, were non-preemptive, as are some modern specialized operating system uh, systems, including, importantly, real-time operating systems. These are designed for embedded software, for some processes must have non-interrupted CPU time. You don't want the emergency gimbal control routine on the rocket interrupted mid-calculation because someone else should get the CPU now. Question 7, then. Speculate a bit. In a non-preemptive operating system, when does the CPU change to a different process? you got to be running kernel code for this to even happen, a user program won't do it. But there's no timer interrupt, and no kernel code to handle a timer interrupt. So where in the kernel code does the 
let's check and see if we should switch running processes code up here. Back from a pause. Generally speaking, it, it's in every system call. Anytime a user process makes a system call in a non-preemptive operating system, that's the operating system's chance to check on whether sleep times have elapsed, the CPU should switch to a new process, etc. In effect, one of the first lines of code in any system call in a non-preemptive operating system is some function call like do scheduling. But if a user process doesn't make a system call, then like a senator filibustering a bill, it can indefinitely keep the CPU, never giving the kernel code a chance to get a word in. Now again, all of this will be covered in much greater detail in an operating system class. For now, just understand the terms given and the basic ideas.